The great thing about Mackinac is it has a, a very long and rich history that doesn't uh, just embrace or embody one era or one theme. It is uh, an area that has consistently been important and significant for a variety of peoples for a very long period of time. Here at Michelin Mackinac, where two great lakes meet, people have been gathering for hundreds of years. Whether drawn by their faith, trade, diplomacy, or a desire to defend their homes and culture, these people have all helped make Michelin Mackinac the crossroads of the Great Lakes. Long before Europeans arrived, Native Americans journeyed to the Straits of Mackinac every summer. They fished, traded with one another, conducted diplomacy, and visited nearby islands for religious ceremonies. These people called themselves the Anishinaabek. The Anishinaabek are comprised of three tribes primarily, that being the Odawa, same as Ottawa, Ojibwe, same as um, Chippewa, and the Potawatomi. Together, we make the Anishinaabek. According to one of our historians, Basil Johnston, he's an Ojibwe from Cape Croker. According to his creation beliefs, the first Anishinaabe was created on Mackinac Island. That is the spot where it all began for us. A focal point was here right at the Straits. For subsistence was the fishing. We knew if we were in this area, we would always eat. And the white fish, the Adikigigu, was one of our main staples. Also, it was for trade. The Odawa were trading with other native tribes throughout North America before the arrival of Europeans, and it was just a natural area to come and meet. And also, for cultural reasons, a lot of our ancestors are buried on the islands. Europeans reached the Straits of Mackinac in the early 17th century. French explorers found a region rich in fur-bearing animals and well-established native trading networks. These animals, especially the beaver, were in high demand in Europe where their fur was used to make hats and other fashionable garments. French merchants journeyed to the Straits to purchase furs from the Anishinaabek and other native traders, but preferred to return to Montreal or Quebec for the winter months. In 1670, Father Claude de Blon founded the Jesuit mission of St. Ignace on Mackinac Island. A year later, Father Jacques Marquette relocated the mission to the north side of the Straits. A French trading settlement sprang up around the mission, as well as nearby Odawa and Wyandot villages. Around 1690, soldiers constructed Fort de Bois to bar rival British merchants from the region. The trade proved too successful, and with the national economy suffering under the surplus, King Louis XIV ordered the Great Lakes fur trade closed and Fort de Bois and other posts abandoned. By 1710, the Odawa had relocated their village to the south shore of the Straits, and Father Joseph Mare relocated the St. Ignace mission to follow them. The French government reopened the fur trade, now with additional regulations, and traders again gathered at the Straits. Beginning in 1712, French troops gathered at the mission in anticipation of a campaign against the Muskaki tribe of Wisconsin. Around 1715, Troops under the command of Captain Constant Le Marchand de Lignery built a fort near the mission. They named the fort Michelin-Mackinac. The original fort was small, but a major expansion took place in the mid-1730s. The walls were enlarged, and new houses and a powder magazine were built. The Straits of Mackinac really are the heart of the North American continent. It is basically the three Great Lakes of Superior, Michigan, and Huron come together and the water routes that flow into those lakes go to much of the North America. One of the most important ways to think about it is an entrepot, which is a really fancy way of saying that a lot of things were transferred here, a lot of people passed through here with a lot of goods and a lot of ideas, and it was a place of great exchange. Michelin Mackinac served as a center of the Great Lakes fur trade. It was a distribution center for all sorts of manufactured goods that were being shipped here by water uh, from Montreal. So that's things like blankets and beads and muskets and axe heads. This is a distribution center for all those things. They get sent out to villages and small trading posts all around the Great Lakes where they're used to purchase furs from native trappers. 
Mishkla Makna as a result also serves as a collection point for all of those furs coming from all over the Western Great Lakes. They're collected here and then they are shipped back east, first to Montreal and ultimately over to Europe. French Canadian merchants and indigenous trappers profited from the Mishkla Makna fur trade. Both groups attempted to work together to maximize profits. French traders married into native families and adopted the traditional practice of exchanging gifts before conducting business. The French colonial government also distributed gifts to maintain military alliances and trade relationships. Michelin Mackinac was not immune from conflict, however. Beginning in 1744, France and Britain were once again at war, severely limiting the flow of trade goods to Michelin Mackinac. The French garrison again expanded the fort to incorporate improved defenses. Some of the local Anishinaabek grew increasingly unhappy with the French and threatened Michelin Mackinac with violence. Tensions eased when the war ended in 1748, but new threats continued to arise. Aggressive British traders pushed into the Ohio country to trade. Charles Langlade organized a raid against the British trading post at Picklewillany in 1752. Langlade, born at Michilimackinac in 1729 to a French father and Odawa mother, led a mixed force of Frenchmen and his Odawa relatives. Frontier clashes such as the one at Picklewillany grew in intensity until they exploded into the Seven Years' War in 1754. Although it began in North America, the conflict eventually became a true world war. The French were fighting for their empire in North America from their perspective, so that's what they ultimately hoped to win. And to be able to ma maintain their presence in North America because this had a, was a part of the worldwide conflict they had with, with, with Britain. French officials recruited indigenous warriors to fight the British intruders. Beginning in 1755, when they helped defeat General Edward Braddock in Pennsylvania, war parties were dispatched from Michelin Mackinac every year. Another large force fought at the Battle of Fort William Henry and the battles along Lake George and the Lake Champlain area in 1757. In 1757, though, they, uh, the Adawa, the Potawatomi, the Menominee, and, and other Western Indians brought smallpox back. Uh, from, from those battles and decimated places like Larbor Croche. The Menominee were really hit very, very hard. 1758, by and large, the natives sat out. 1759, they were present at the Battle of Quebec and Plains of Abraham. Charles Longlaud was a leader. A large number of, of again, of Mackinac, Adawa, and Ojibwe were there. And Longlaud and Indians from Mackinac were at Montreal when that uh, capitulated in, in 1760. The fall of Montreal sealed the fate of France's Northern American Empire. By the end of 1760, Britain effectively ruled all of what had been French Canada, including Michilimackinac. The people of Michilimackinac did not initially welcome their new British neighbors. Hostile Anishinaabek threatened to kill British traders unless they offered favorable trading terms. Fortunately, British troops arrived soon after, and the British commander informed the villagers of the generous peace terms which ended the war in Canada. The French Canadians were allowed to retain their property, businesses, and Catholic faith. The French and British gradually improved their relationship, forging new trade partnerships. However, General Geoffrey Amherst, commander-in-chief of British forces in North America, placed new restrictions on the fur trade and ceased distributing gifts to native leaders. For the native people, they were going to have to deal with a new imperial power who had not conquered them. From the native perspective, the Ojibwe and the uh, Adawa, the English hadn't conquered them. They hadn't lost. It was the French who had lost. And so that was going to create a whole dynamic that was going to have to be worked out. And the other was that they wanted to throw out the British. The British were taking their lands. The British had not covered their dead. Uh, the British really were not behaving as they ought. They were not respecting Indian protocol. And consequently, was, we want to get rid of the British and we want to be prepared for the French. Frustrated by British disrespect and trade policies, Pontiac and Adawa war leader 
urged indigenous peoples around the Great Lakes to rise up against the British. The tribes knew they had to take up arms to survive what was happening to them and to protect their freedoms. And the tribes were preemptive and they had the right and the belief that this is my native homeland, this is my indigenous homeland and I'm gonna fight for it. And for one summer in 1763, we were successful in fighting off the most powerful empire in the world. At Michilimackinac, Ojibwa leaders Minwewe and Majikiwis heeded Pontiac's call. They gathered hundreds of men to attack the fort in June 1763. On the king's birthday, they gathered outside the fort to play a game of Bogataway. At a prearranged signal, the players tossed the ball near the fort's open gate. The Ojibwa charged inside, capturing or killing British soldiers. Michilimackinac fell to the Ojibwa in a few minutes. Similar native attacks captured seven other British forts around the Great Lakes. British troops returned in 1764, and British officials altered their policies to be more acceptable to the Anishinaabek and other indigenous groups. Although French Canadians remained crucial to the fur trade, British merchants also participated in the business. Some Michilimackinac merchants, such as John Askin, became immensely wealthy. Like the French, British officials worked to build alliances with the Anishinaabek and other native groups. Every summer, Michilimackinac's commanding officer held councils with native leaders, distributing gifts and securing promises of friendship. Captain Arendt de Peister, who took command in 1774, was a particularly successful diplomat. De Peister organized a council in 1775 which brokered peace between the Ojibwa and their traditional enemies, the Dakota Sioux. These councils and relationships became critical as unrest in Britain's Atlantic colonies grew into open revolt in 1775. As the rebellion spread, it threatened Michilimackinac's existence. The British strategy really before the war and through the early years of the war was to maintain the status quo out here. So basically to keep Americans out of this area and to keep the native people of the Great Lakes, if not positively allied with the British cause, then at the very least to be neutral. So they were not actively supporting the Americans. So I really feel that tribes were, and individual communities were looking at what is best for my community. How am I gonna weather this storm once again? And with the, uh, the revolution, it's, again, taking sides with your enemy. I mean, they were just at war with the British only a few years earlier, and now they're allying with the British. During the war, groups of Native men formed into these war parties go up from Michilimackinac to a variety of different places. Very early on, in 1776, they went to Montreal to attempt to drive off the American invasion of Canada. A year later, in 1777, they went to New York to link up with Burgoyne's campaign moving south out of Canada. They went eventually down into southern Michigan to block what they thought was going to be an American thrust up from the Illinois country. In late 1779, Lieutenant Governor Patrick Sinclair replaced De Peister as commanding officer. Concerned that Michilimackinac's location on the shoreline left it vulnerable to attack, as well as the increasingly questionable loyalty of the local Anishinaabek. Sinclair ordered the entire community move to Mackinac Island. Soldiers began disassembling military structures for relocation, while other troops reassembled them inside Fort Mackinac, a new post they were building on the island. Like the military buildings, civilian structures were also relocated, either over the ice in winter or by boat in summer. With France now allied with the Americans, Sinclair separated the French-Canadian civilian community. While soldiers built the new fort on a bluff, he ordered the civilians to rebuild their community on the shoreline below. As construction continued in 1780, Sinclair organized the largest war party dispatched from Michilimackinac. Nearly 1,000 native warriors joined Canadian traders and a few British soldiers to strike Spanish possessions in St. Louis, Missouri. Spain supported France in the growing war, and Spanish troops threatened British interests in the West. The St. Louis expedition ended inconclusively, and Sinclair returned his attention to the new fort on Mackinac Island. The old mainland fort was mostly moved by midsummer 1781. Soldiers burned anything that could not be removed. 
Construction of Fort Mackinac progressed slowly and at great expense. Sinclair was relieved of command in 1782. When the war ended with an American victory in 1783, the Straits of Mackinac became part of the new United States. On the mainland, meanwhile, drifting sands covered the charred remains of Michilimackinac. The old fort was never forgotten, however, and the site was set aside as a park in 1857. Designated Michigan's second state park in 1909, the site of Michilimackinac was preserved by the Mackinac Island State Park Commission. Beginning in 1959 and continuing every summer since, archaeologists have excavated the original remains of Michilimackinac. Our more specific goals now are to learn more about daily life, um, particularly at this site, which is, was such an important part of the fur trade frontier. So we're interested in questions about military life, about fur trade life, and about how people came together, the French, the British, the various native nations, and how they made a community out here and how we can learn about that archaeologically. Today, ongoing archaeological and historical research continues to inform new exhibits, programs, and reconstructions. You, our visitors, make this possible through your admission fees. We thank you for your support and invite you to explore Michilimackinac and meet the people who continue to make this the crossroads of the Great Lakes. This program made possible by Mackinac Associates, friends preserving and sharing Mackinac's heritage. Inquire about becoming a member today. Colonial Michilimackinac is owned and operated by the Mackinac Island State Park Commission, protecting, preserving, and presenting Mackinac's historic and natural treasures since 1895. Welcome to Colonial Michilimackinac. As you explore the site, you are stepping back in time to the 1770s during the American Revolution. Here you will meet Anishinaabek diplomats, British soldiers, French-Canadian voyageurs, merchant families, and more. Use your site map to navigate the fort. All of the buildings are numbered, and it works best to visit them in numerical order. Historical interpreters are stationed throughout the site to perform demonstrations and lead tours. They are happy to answer your questions, so don't be afraid to ask. Demonstrations and tours occur throughout the day. Consult your site map for times and locations. All of the reconstructed buildings inside the fort are open to explore. Each contains an exhibit or recreated historic scene and is identified on your site map. Restrooms and drinking fountains are located in the South Southwest Row House, number 20 on your site map, as well as to the south of the entrance path outside the fort. Be sure to visit Treasures from the Sand, our premier archaeological exhibit. It is located under the Northwest Row House, number 7 on your site map. The reconstruction of Michilimackinac is based on an ongoing archaeological program begun in 1959. During the summer months, stop by the excavation site to ask questions and watch the archaeologists at work. Colonial Michilimackinac is entirely smoke-free. Thank you for not smoking. Support for many programs and exhibits at Colonial Michilimackinac is provided by Mackinac Associates. Inquire at the admissions area for information about becoming a member. A museum store is located in the South Southwest Row House, Building 20 on your site map. Original books published by the Mackinac State Historic Parks are the most rewarding souvenirs of your visit. Special events occur throughout the season. Inquire at the admission area for a schedule and more information. Don't forget to visit our other historic sites in Mackinac City. The old Mackinac Point Lighthouse is just east of the Mackinac Bridge while historic Mill Creek Discovery Park is located three miles east of Mackinac City on US-23. Combination tickets are available at the admission area. <laughs>